Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, Pamela is about probabilistic programming languages, in case you're curious, but I won't say anything more about that. Uh, also, the projector is having fun with some of the titles. With uh, it's like playing, challenging you to figure out: Can you figure out in English what the title says? So this one is: Network computers are unacceptably insecure, and essentially all computers are networked. So I'd like to start to talk about that by reminding you of this picture. I don't know if you're familiar with this picture of a Jeep Cherokee uh, in a ditch, but I'd like to sort of situate you in that. So I'd invite you to close your eyes and imagine you're driving on Interstate 64 outside of St. Louis, Missouri, so maybe last year's ICFP. Uh, and as you're driving along the highway, with your hands on the steering wheel, all of a sudden, the air conditioner comes on and starts blasting cold air at you. And as you look down at the console to try to figure out why the air conditioner's going, all of a sudden, the radio comes on and starts blasting ski low rap music, which you probably didn't select. Um, and then the windshield wipers come on and the fluid starts coming up, so now your, your windshield is all, all fuzzy. And then you start to go up an overpass and the transmission cuts out. So as you, even as you press your foot down on the accelerator, the RPMs go up, but the car starts to slow down. And you look in your rearview mirror and you see a semi-truck coming up behind you. So all of that actually happened to Andy Greenberg, who's a Wired, News, Wired Magazine reporter. Um, he kind of knew what he was getting into when he got into this Jeep Cherokee because he was invited to do so by Charlie Miller and Chris Falachek, who were two white hat hackers who had figured out how to wirelessly hack into this particular car and take over control of essentially all of the functionality of the car, well, all of the functionality of the car that's controlled by software. So they weren't actually, the, you can open your eyes now if you're followed instructions and still have your eyes closed. Um, they weren't actually the first people to do this. Yoshi Kona from the University of Washington and Stefan Savage from the University of California, San Diego, did essentially the same thing about five years prior to that with a different car. They showed in a first paper that if they were connected into the diagnostic port that's required by law in the US to be under the steering wheel from all cars made after 1996, they could take over all of the functionality of the car that's controlled by software. And pretty much all of the functionality in the car is controlled by software for a variety of really good reasons, right? The steering is controlled by uh, software so it can do the fancy you know, parallel parking because who wants to parallel park on their own? The acceleration is controlled by software because of the cruise control and um, braking is controlled by software for anti-lock braking, which is a hu huge safety feature. The locks are controlled by software so that you can use the key fob to unlock your, your car and so that's, um, uh, and then your car is also connected to a whole bunch of different networks. So in the first paper, Stefan and Yoshi showed that if they were plugged into the car, they could do this. And the reaction to that first paper was a little bit muted because if you're plugged into the diagnostic part under the car, well, you're physically in the car, you have possession of the car, you could take over control of those functionality without having to do anything electronic. In a second paper, they showed they could do the same thing in a bunch of different ways without actually physically touching the car themselves. So they were able to put a virus on a laptop that was mechanics, and then when the mechanic connected to the car, the virus spread and allowed them to take over control. They were able to hack into the Bluetooth interface when the car came kind of out from the parking lot, they could brute force the, um, the pairing function and be able to then upload their control software um, through the, uh, they also be able to hack into the entertainment system where they created a version of a, a Beethoven symphony that played fine on many uh, stereo systems, but when played on a particular uh, DVD or CD player that was in the car, caused a buffer overflow that allowed them to take over remote access. And then they were able to hack in through the, um, the telematics unit. So the telematics unit is the industry generic term for things like Uconnect for Chrysler or um, OnStar for GM. It's the thing that um, if you lock your keys out of the car, you can call up OnStar and they, will, they can re remotely unlock your car. Um, or if your car is in an accident, they can uh, detect the fact that you were in an accident and arrange for the paramedics to come or police to come to help you. So very important safety feature, but that means the way that's implemented is your car has a cell phone number and hackers can call that cell phone number and use it to communicate with the car. So basically a, a modern automobile is really uh, 
computer on wheels. In fact, a modern automobile has somewhere between 30 and 100 what are called embedded control units. But an embedded control unit is just a computer. They're all networked together on a network called the CAN bus. Actually, there are several CAN buses. That's just the CAN is just the protocol that it uses. Um, they all bridge each other. There's no authentication, no encryption. So it's basically the assumption in these cars is that anything that's talking on that network is a good guy and is doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, so no security. Right. Uh, so they showed that you could hack in, and it's not just cars, right? There's many, many different kinds of systems that are, in fact, network computers. You know, uh, you know phones and communication devices, medical devices like insulin pumps and pacemakers, um, television sets, refrigerators, like many, many more things are becoming network computers. And all of them have these security problems. So why are these systems so insecure? Well, really, part of it comes down to um, how complicated it is to build a secure system, right? To, get, to build a system that is secure, you have to get absolutely everything right. And there's a lot of things that you have to get right. Things like the overall design of the system, and then how you specify that overall design, and then how you implement that design, uh, how you use resources, so how you can leak information out the side. Is it configured properly? Are the users using the system properly? Do they have appropriately strong passwords? Do you have malicious inside users? What about the libraries that you used? Are they good security-wise? What about the hardware you use? Right? We see with Rohammer and Spectre that the hardware has security vulnerabilities, and on and on and on. Right? So like, even this octopus doesn't have enough arms to take care of all these different kinds of security problems. There's also the challenge that the financial incentives of the companies that make these products don't really align with producing good, secure systems. Um, so the car manufacturers, for example, have very, very narrow margins. So they don't have extra money to burn on building higher assurance software. So if they, they, if they increase the cost to manufacture the car by spending more time to build higher quality software, they have to be able to recoup that cost or they'll go broke over time. Um, and so they have to increase the cost of the car, but then they have to be able to explain to the customer why their car costs more than the competitor that didn't do this. So how would, like, how would they do that? Well, normally when they add a feature that adds cost, they then advertise, like, oh, look, you can get this cool new feature if you get this car. So now imagine that they advertise that our car is more secure than other cars. Most consumers have no idea that their car is insecure in the first place. So I think the, the natural first reaction is like, wait, my car can be hacked? I'm just not going to buy a new car. I'm going to keep my current car that doesn't have, you know, that hasn't been hacked as far as I know, right? Um, another consequence could be that you know hackers, a, a part of the hacker culture is getting you know famous and credibility. And so if you hack into a car that has been advertised to be more secure, then you get more credibility. So you're kind of pointing hackers at your car if you're advertising your car being more secure. And now imagine that somebody manages to, like you didn't you you put a lot of time into making it more secure, and it is in fact maybe more secure. And that if you knew if you had perfect knowledge, there are fewer exploitable vulnerabilities, fewer bugs in your system than in the others. But if there's still some, and the hacker actually manages to find them, and then publishes them, practically speaking, your car is less secure, even though, in some absolute sense, it's more secure. So you can't really advertise. So you can't really increase the price unilaterally. So everybody has to increase the price at the same time. But how do you get a whole industry to do the same thing at the same time? Right? They can't just meet and do this. That's illegal. It's collusion. Right? So you need to have some outside force that puts pressure on it. So one possible outside force would be like the, you know, the US government saying, you, know, you must have your car built to these kinds of hacking standards. Of course, today it's very hard to imagine the US government saying anything of the sort. <laughs> California might actually do something of that flavor, and California's car market is large enough that that might actually have some effect. Um, another possibility is the insurance industry starts to track and notice vulnerabilities and explain costs related to vulnerabilities. So this is happening a little bit in London. Lloyds of London stopped insuring uh, Land Rovers because they were being stolen electronically so often. So unless you had your Land Rover parked in a locked garage, you couldn't, um, you couldn't get insurance. So that could have a, an overarching effect. Um, it's starting to be possible to see, imagine that car companies might proactively decide that they have an existential threat to their existence if somebody sort of hacks into their fleet and disabled a whole bunch of their cars, maybe that would make the car, that particular 
cause so much damage that the car company would maybe go out of business. So I think there's hope in the long run, but it's still a very complicated process. So uh, I'm just going to talk about one piece of this, which is implementation errors and how we can do a better job solving implementation errors. This is just one piece of this huge security problem. But I would say it's actually an important part of the security picture. So this says there are many exploitable vulnerabilities. So just some terminology, a vulnerability is essentially a bug in the software, someplace where there's a mistake. An exploit is something that takes advantage of that bug to be able to cause the uh, hacker to have some, uh, some authority or, or capability that they're not supposed to have. So this chart uh, is published by the um, Vulnerability DB, and it's their 2018 mid-year quick view. And what it's doing is showing how many um, of the vulnerabilities that they've reported, how many of them have publicly available exploits or exploits. So the first category is ones where they don't, there, there's a vulnerability, but they don't know whether or not it can be exploited. And the next one is public exploits, privately available exploits, and then a public proof of concept from which somebody could develop a, an actual exploit. And what this shows is that in the first half of 2018, 41% of the 10,599 vulnerabilities had a public exploit available. Or, uh, yeah. So basically, a lot of vulnerabilities can be converted into exploits. So vulnerabilities are annoying, exploits are dangerous. Right? So a lot of vulnerabilities are dangerous. And then those vulnerabilities can cause bad things to happen. So uh, the, the title this time is Ubiquitous and Pernicious. So, uh, these vulnerabilities allow, sometimes allow hackers to take over remote control, so to get remote access, and sometimes they allow the exfiltration of information. So just some examples, the Microsoft Security Bulletin MS-15078 reported the remote execution on every single Windows platform that was supported at the time that was uh, triggered by a buffer underflow in the Adobe Type Manager library. So any Windows platform that you were running at that time could be exploited using that particular vulnerability. And then Heartbleed had a missing bounds check, so another bug in the code, that allowed an attacker to be able to exfiltrate information in a way that left no trace that there had been any kind of attack on your machine. So remote code execution, exfiltrate vulnerable information, basically vulnerabilities can cause um, bad things to happen. This is exploit kits leverage software bugs. So the actual process of converting from a vulnerability into an exploit, unbelievably difficult. The hackers who do this are geniuses. Right? The, the ingenuity and the sideways thinking that they have to put in to be able to do that is, is uh, mind-boggling. Some of them also have an entrepreneurial spirit. So after they figured out how to convert the bugs into exploits, they can package them up and sell them, essentially on the dark web. What's scary about this is now you don't have to have the genius of being able to convert the vulnerability into an exploit on your own. You just have to be able to know how to go and buy it and then be able to use it. So it's sort of enabling using exploits for the masses, or at least a much larger collection of people than who can actually do the, the exploits themselves. Right, so we need to fix this situation. So the hypothesis here is that formal methods can eliminate many exploitable vulnerabilities. Uh, and if you've been around for a while, your reaction is probably like, oh, come on, right? The formal methods community has been saying this essentially since the beginning of software. So like for more than 50 years, the formal methods community has been promising we can get rid of vulnerabilities. So some skepticism is in order. So what I want to talk about now is why now is actually a good time to revisit this hypothesis that formal methods actually can say important things about security. So one of the things that's different is that there's faster hardware and more memory. So it turns out that formal methods is largely a search process. And so being able to search a large space very, very quickly, incredibly important for formal methods to be able to be practical. And you know, the architects have been doing this amazing job with Moore's Law, giving us more and more cycles and more and more memory. And so that's just like the underlying platform that the formal methods researchers have been working on has been getting much, much better. So that's a really important contribution for why formal methods are much more practical now. Kind of the same thing with machine learning, right? Machine learning is practical now, not because the algorithms are so much different than they were before, but because we have a lot more data, a lot more data, a lot more disk space, a lot more network capacity, and a lot more computer cycles. Then we have more automation. So this is a, a graph talking about SAT solvers. How many know what a SAT solver is? Okay, most of you. So 
uh, the idea is that you can, SAT solver is finding, is a formula with and or not over Boolean variables. The goal is to find an assignment of true and false to those variables that makes the overall formula true. This is relevant for program analysis and for bug finding because you can encode many questions about programs in extremely large Boolean formula. So being able to solve these Boolean formula quickly is very important. It's an NP-hard problem in practice. So, or sorry, it's an NP-hard problem in theory. And so we can't have a, uh, a system that solves all of these problems. But it turns out many interesting problems are solvable very quickly anyway. So this has created a cottage industry like, around the world competing to make the best SAT solver. And this graph is showing the results. So there's an annual competition. And Daniel LeBaire took the winner of this competition every year from 2002 to 2010. And he took their winning solution and he ported it to a 2011 machine. And he ran it on the 2009 uh, competition benchmarks. And then plotted all of the results on this graph. So each, the horizontal axis is how many problems have been solved. The vertical axis is how much time it's taken. And each sort of line corresponds to one of the solvers. Each point, like this point, is how long it took the, uh, the glucose 09 solver to solve 120 problems. So if we just look at this place, 80 problems, how long did it take to solve 80 problems? The best solver in 2002 took 1,000 seconds, whereas in 2010, it only took 40 seconds. So that's a drop of two orders of magnitude on top of the performance improvements that came from the hardware, because these were all running on the same hardware at this point. So much, much more automation. And then another really significant contribution is the infrastructure. So 50 years ago, when formal methods researchers started promising this, they were simultaneously working on the research infrastructure to do the formal methods and then applying that research infrastructure to the particular problems. They were kind of wearing two hats at the same time. Whereas now, there are tons of resources available. And sure, much of this is sort of beta quality prototype software or research quality software, but it's good enough that people can use it who are not the original developers. There's enough tutorials, there's enough documentation, there's enough quality of the software that people who are not develop th developing them can actually use them for real. And that's a super important contribution or difference. And then the third one, which I'm sure you can't read, um, is from this report of using formal methods at Amazon Web Services, which was published in 2014. They say that we have found that testing the code is inadequate as a method to find subtle errors in design, as the number of reachable states of the code is astronomical. So we looked for a better approach. Basically, what th this white paper talks about is how at Amazon Web Services, one in a million events happen every second. Like, there's just so many events that they're happening all the time. And humans are really, really bad at thinking about one in a million circumstances, right? If to our intuition, one in a million, don't bother. But at the scale that we're working these days, one in a million, you have to think about. And formal methods are a way of forcing you to think in all those weird corner cases and being able to do some of it automatically. So that's why I think formal methods now is worth exploring. So I went to DARPA which is the crazy mad scientist of the Defense Department in the US, uh, whose mission is detecting and creating strategic surprise. And it's an organization that's not afraid of taking pretty extreme risks. So I was able to convince DARPA to try out using formal methods to try to get systems to be more secure. So the setup was that uh, the, the threat model was that the attacker did not have physical access to the vehicle. The attacker could, had to be able to attack remotely. And that assumption was because attacks that you can do remotely are much more scalable. You can do them from anywhere in the world. Um, and so our, our sort of the threat is much, much higher than a threat where you actually have to get physical access to a system. We also assumed that the hardware was correct. That's not because we think the hardware was correct, but it's because we only can do so many things at once. Um, we had various <coughs> experimental platforms, including uh, Arducopter, which you can just buy off the shelf from Amazon. It had about 100,000 lines of code plus Boeing's unmanned little bird helicopter, which is a fully functioning helicopter. It can take up to two pilots, but it can also fly completely autonomously. Then at the beginning of the program to assess the security profile of these uh, vehicles, we had a, a world-class red team spend six weeks trying to break into the platforms. And they were able to take over control of both the quadcopter and the unmanned little bird, really without breaking a sweat. So on the quadcopter, this was not at all surprising. The manufacturers 
biggest concern, in some sense, is probably like the quadcopter is flying in the park and no one can connect to it, as opposed to <laughs> too many people can connect to it. Um, whereas for the, the Boeing engineers were quite surprised that the red team was able to, to take over control of the helicopter. They thought they had done a really good job doing the security. They, they might have done a good job, just not quite good enough. Um, so the, to get a, get a demonstration of how this works, I'll try to play the video. Um, which is self-explanatory. This is an AR drone quadcopter. We'll be using its airframe in our research vehicle in the Hackens project. Eventually, we'll upgrade its control electronics so that we can host the provably secure software that we're developing on the project. But for now, it serves as a convenient platform to demonstrate the kind of security vulnerabilities we're concerned about in Hackens. Even though it is essentially a toy, it illustrates the same sort of vulnerabilities that can be found in many network-enabled cyber-physical systems including automobiles, SCADA systems, and aircraft. The AR drone is controlled using standard Wi-Fi technology. It acts as a Wi-Fi access point to which you can connect with a phone, tablet, or PC running the ground station application. Aircrack is a readily available software package for monitoring and injecting traffic onto wireless networks. We will use it to attack the AR drone from this laptop. First, we identify the physical address of the drone access point. Next, we send commands to deauthenticate all clients, including the ground station. The ground station now has no control over the vehicle. The attacker laptop has taken control of the vehicle, and the ground station is not able to reconnect. Finally, we can send arbitrary commands from the attacker laptop. In this case, we will simply cause the vehicle to land. Even though this was a very straightforward attack, it is representative of some of the current threats to network cyber physical systems that we will address in the Hackens project. So, uh, so that showed that the hackers were able to pretty easily uh, hack in and take over control. So then what the, the blue teams then, the formal methods researchers, got the opportunity to uh, go and revise the software, replace the software in the system, and then at the end of the 16 months, they had to give the system back to the red team to attack again. So on the quadcopter, what they did was they, they started out with the one that you could buy from Amazon, and then they replaced the hardware to give a slightly more powerful chip. They put in a, uh, an RTOS, and then they put in a hardware abstraction layer so that they could run the original uh, RGCopter software on top of this new underlying platform. And then they started to go to work on this piece, replacing pieces of the original software with higher assurance versions um, so they replaced the free RTOS with a high assurance one that was built by NICTA, which is now Data61 in Australia. They generated so the flight control code uh, by writing in a domain-specific language embedded in Haskell that would then generate the C code along with proof assurances that could be checked in a model checker. They generated the glue code to connect everything together from a high-level specification, and then they put all of this into a, um, a reasoning system that allowed them to prove properties about the overlying of the overarching system. So uh, they were able to, in the 16 months that they were working, they were able to build stability control, altitude hold, directional hold, and denial of service attack detection into the code. And they got about 80% of the GPS waypoint navigation uh, built. So they had almost all the functionality of the quadcopter they started with. They also proved properties about the overarching system. So they proved that it's memory safe, that it ignored all malformed messages from the outside world, that it ignored all non-authenticated messages, and that every good message that actually reached the, uh, the quadcopter was executed on. The red team then got uh, another six weeks with full access to the system. They knew all the code, they had all the code, they participated in all the design meetings, so they knew as much about the system as reasonable to assume to know about the system. And at the end of that six weeks, they were not able to take over control. So my colleague at DARPA, who is an expert in penetration testing, his assessment is that that UAV was the most secure UAV on the entire planet at that time, which is kind of scary, thinking about what UAVs are doing. Right, okay, but that's kind of a toy. So then the question was, well, actually there's one more story to tell about that, which is, at this point, my boss at DARPA came to talk to me and he said basically that these results fully justified the entire expense of the program, which was at that point a $70 million program, and also that DARPA had fully expected the program to entirely fail, right? So they thought they were gonna spend $70 million and get nothing, 
but did this already justify that, that expense? So at the end, so then they started like, okay, let's apply these tools and techniques to Boeing's Unmanned Little Bird. Now this platform is proprietary and ITAR restricted, which means that only Boeing engineers can access it. So most of the formal methods researchers, in fact, all of the formal methods researchers couldn't actually touch the Boeing the Little Bird. They instead had to train the Boeing engineers to use the tools and techniques that had been developed to make this system more secure. So this system has two, this helicopter has two computers, a flight control computer that basically makes sure the helicopter can fly, does things like altitude hold and stability, things like that, and then a mission control computer that talks to the ground station, it talks to the flight control com uh, computer. It's the thing that gets instructions to say, fly over there, take a picture of that, fly over there, th things like that. So the, the blue teams used the RTOS on the mission control computer, used SEO4 microkernel on the flight control computer. What they did there was they used SEO4, which is a microkernel that is the, the part of the operating system that absolutely positively has to run in privileged mode. They used it to create multiple partitions. One of the partitions, they put the high assurance code that they wrote from scratch. And that high assurance code was responsible for talking to the flight control computer, for talking to the ground station, for doing the message authentication, for things like that. The other partition, they put the code that they didn't care particularly whether it was secure or not. So they decided that they didn't care about the security of the camera code. So all of the camera code they put in the mission control computer, all the legacy code that they didn't get around to, to worrying about the security they put on the mission control computer. So then at the end of phase two, they allowed the red team, instead of having to attack the helicopter from outside the helicopter, they allowed the red team to put whatever code they wanted in that insecure partition on the mission control computer, and they charged them to break out or disrupt the operation of the overall helicopter. All they could do was fork bomb themselves. So they could cause their, their own partition to go down, which would cause the uh, high assurance partition to, to kind of like, oh wait, the, that partition went down again, let's reboot it. So it would take off the camera for you know, 10 seconds at a time, something like that. But otherwise they were unable to affect the operation of the helicopter at all. And DARPA was so confident that at the end of phase three, they allowed them to do that test while the helicopter was in flight with two test pilots in the helicopter. And again, nothing bad happened, so that, that's good. Um, the, uh, the US passed the John McCain National Defense Authorization Act in 2019. That's what pays for the Defense Department. Uh, in, in that law, they directed the Department of Defense to study formal programming and protocol languages for software code development and other methods and tools developed under various programs, such as the Hackens program. Right, so the program was so successful that even Congress knew about it and told uh, the Department of Defense to explore using these techniques. Okay, so that's some evidence that we are in fact ready to use formal methods uh, for security critical applications. So I've been talking about formal methods for a long time, but I haven't actually told you what they are. So uh, when I wrote this talk, I started like looking around for definitions of formal methods. This is a representative one, which basically says it's applying a whole bunch of theoretical computer science to problems in software, which is not very informative. I think it's an example of one of these things that you know where you see it. Um, what I would say is there are techniques that are based on math, that are machine checkable, and that they're capable of proving properties about software or hardware or actually models of those. But it's really important to read the fine print, right? They only do what they really say they do, not what you think they do. Your assumptions can be unreasonable. If you assume false, you can prove anything. And your guarantees can be too weak. So it's, it's, uh, you have to be very careful in using formal methods that you know what you're getting. So there are a whole bunch of different kinds of formal methods. There's a whole bunch of ranges. So this graph kind of shows the space. The horizontal axis is how much user effort is required to use them slash how much they scale. So here, it's like fully automatic and you don't need, um, and you can scale to as much code as you want. Over here, it takes PhD years to use and you're talking about thousands of lines of code. And so the quadcopter was about 80,000 lines of code. Um, then we have how much strong the guarantees are. So at the bottom, you have like type safety. So any type checker is in fact a formal method tool. In the middle, you have things like no runtime errors. And at the top, you have full functional correctness, maybe even you know, uh, resource usage. And the kind of tools go from type system to symbolic education, um, execution, model checkers, static analyzers, runtime monitoring, automatic theorem provers, and then the interactive theorem provers. We're seeing a lot of, act and then these orange things are systems that have been verified or 
improvement, properties of improvement about them using that particular technique. So the strongest properties come about in the interactive theorem proving and the top quadrant. Okay, so now if you think about like what kinds of software do you really most want to have verified? Right? You probably don't care if your you know, Atari game is verified or your Facebook app is verified. But there are other kinds of software that think, no, it would be really nice to have that verified. And the kind of things that come to mind are like separation kernels, hypervisors, real-time real -time operating systems, compilers, garbage collectors, file systems, web browsers, sandboxes, crypto. And the good news is that for each one of those categories, there are already practical systems, maybe you know, research proof of concept, but like big enough to do real world things that have been proven to be fully functionally correct in the published literature. So just to, to pick two of them that are representative and particularly influential, one of these is the SEL4 microkernel. So as I said before, a microkernel is the core part of an operating system that absolutely has to be in privileged mode. It has things like the ability to set up partitions where nothing from one partition can interfere with another partition. Um, so this group in Australia, which was at Nick, called NICT at the time and now is called Data61 because having a world famous brain, brand that you change the name of is a really good idea. <laughs> um, they implemented and proved the SEL4 is correct in Isabel and Hall. The actual microkernel is about 10,000 lines of C code. Uh, the proof is 480,000 lines, which is uh, quite a large, uh, bigger effort. It took them about 21 person years. 13 of which in the verification, eight in building the tooling infrastructure, so that they, if their idea was that if they wanted to do it again from scratch, using the current tooling infrastructure would take them 13 years, they wouldn't have to do the eight years again. Um, the speed, it's the fastest known one-way uh, IPC uh, mechanism, so they're just as fast, they're, they're the fastest in the world, so there's no slowdown in this particular case. And the things that they proved were access control enforcement, so that um, only if you had authority could you actually access a resource. Non-interference, which is the property that they really leveraged in the Boeing experiment to prove that the, the camera partition couldn't interfere with the high security partition. They proved that compiling the C code down to binary, that the binary correctly implemented the, the C code specification. And then they proved that the IPC fast path was correct. It's all available open source, so there's a really nice journal paper um, in talks describing it. This particular system is kind of an outlier in how much proof effort there is with respect to lines of code um, of the system. And I think the reason is that the call graph, like the, the SEL, the microkernel is very um, connected. You can't really divide it up into smaller pieces that you can reason about separately. It's basically one 10,000 blob uh, piece of code that you can't break up. And that's why the, the proof is, is a, that's my hypothesis as to why the proof is an outlier in the amount of time it took. Another canonical uh, example is the CompCert Verified C compiler. So it compiles a subset of C that is used in the aviation industry. It was implemented and proven correct in COC. It's about 42,000 lines of code plus proof that are kind of interleaved. It took uh, roughly three person years, although those are Xavier Lois person years, so we have to kind of have an expansion factor there. He also found me yesterday to say, like, it really should be six, not three. But he pointed out that um, even the SEO4 number at 13 or 21, from a professional development standpoint, is a small number. Compared, like for an academic project or for a small startup, huge, huge number. But for Boeing or Microsoft, you know, another couple of person years is not a big deal, particularly if you get back strong security guarantees about how your system is working. So the um, CompCert compiler is a little bit slower than the standard C compiler. It's the same, it's faster at optimization level zero, but it's a little bit slower at levels one and two. And they're working on getting it qualified to be able to be the compiler for Airbus software, but this qualification process is extremely onerous. They don't really know how to do it, so they're still working on trying to figure that out. And I think one of the reasons why this proof is much smaller is because if you look at the architecture of the compiler, you have a whole bunch of stages. And you just have to prove that each stage is correct. So you can simplify the problem down. It's much more compositional. OK, so why aren't everybody using formal methods? There are a whole bunch of reasons. So one is that there aren't that many people in the world who are good at formal methods. So this data was from a survey in 2009. So I'm sure the numbers are much, much higher, maybe twice as high as this. But still very, very low compared to the number of developers we have. 
Another is that the required level of effort is higher, right? If you have to write the code and prove something is correct, it just takes more time. So this shows of a whole bunch of systems that have been published in the last 10 years, how much time it took. So the high is SEL4 with 21, and then we have three or six, and then 14 months, and then sort of coming down. So non-trivial, but also not astronomical, and getting better as tooling improves. Another thing is performance consequences. It's typically the case that a verified version of the software is slower than a non-verified version. But that's usually because the people doing the verification stop as soon as they get a system whose performance is good enough to be used in practice. Right? We saw with SEO4 that the, the, very, the most important performance metric, they were actually just as fast or faster than their competitors. So it's possible to be just as fast. Another example of that is um, Amazon Web Services started using a verified version of the HMAC digital random bit generation and transport layout security handshake protocols. Um, and these systems are fast enough. That's actually what's running in Amazon Web Services, the verified version. So we're getting to the point where verified systems are fast enough to be used in practical applications. And again, we're benefiting from the fact that hardware is getting so much faster or has been getting so much faster. Another challenge then is not just that um, it runs slower, but also the amount of time it takes. Like if you have to ship the software today in order to stay ahead of your competitor, you don't have time to do that extra work. Um, and here we're, there are various uh, advances in formal methods about using the techniques uh, in, in the normal development process. So Facebook's Infer is a sound static analyzer that runs within the normal development process at Facebook. When you make a change to the code base, you check it in, and before that check is accepted, it's run through the Infer system, and within 10 minutes, it's able to determine, uh, prove certain properties about the code, and it can process the entire code base in about four hours for the entire Android iOS code infrastructure for Facebook. So it's very fast and it's integrated in the development process, which is great, but it only proves the absence of no pointer errors and resource leaks. So it's proving a weaker property, but very, very quickly. And then we have uh, Amazon Web Services is using the, this verification of the, the uh, TLS parts of the, um, their S2N service. And again, what they did there is they proved that the algorithm was functionally correct in a machine checked way. But the low-level implementation of this proof is, is, of the code changes pretty often. And what they did was they were able to set up automation so that when the code changes, they can rerun the proof and reestablish the proof automatically without any inter, um, involvement by a proof engineer. So they had 956 times where somebody changed the code, and only three of them required somebody to come in and manually change the proof. So here the proof was maintainable along with the code. I'm not going to talk about the fine print, but we, you have to be very careful to make sure that you're, um, what you assume is true and that the guarantees that you're given are strong enough to prove what you actually care about. So where are we? So formal methods, I've been talking about them for implementation bugs, but it turns out you can use them for other things that the octopus needs to worry about. The design, for example, side channel information and dependence on third party architectures, or libraries rather. So some of the lessons that we've learned, one is like you don't need to verify all of the code. If you think about the Boeing MN Littlebird, for example, we didn't have to prove anything about all the code running in the camera partition. All we had to do was prove something about SEL4 and what was running in the high assurance partition, and we got security properties of the overall system. Um, there's, of course, still many, many elephants in the room, concurrency being one of them, so there are maybe two elephants in the room. Um, <laughs> Uh, so all of these need a lot more research, you know, more user, better tools, figuring out hardware issues, handling concurrency, and this is another really important one, getting buy-in slash adoption. It's really scary to think about using more advanced formal tools, right? You guys are all at the forefront of the software ecosystem, but there's, you know, vast pile of um, large numbers of, of developers who are, you know, still using Fortran and COBOL and, you know, trying to pull every, you know, you don't have to pull all of them, but get more people to start using these. So at Amazon Web Services, for example, when they started using formal methods, they didn't talk about them in terms of formal methods. There was like one guy who was really worried about their one in a million problem, and he thought formal methods could work, so he went and read some material and, and had the idea of using um, some uh, theorem proving technology, and he figured out how he could do it, but he, he needed to get other people to do it, and he didn't want to talk to them about formal methods. So he went and got one other guy, 
and they talked about it, and then they ran a tutorial for everybody about some of these things, but they called the methods exhaustively testable pseudocode <laughs> instead of formal <laughs> methods, and everybody was really excited afterwards, like, I want to figure out how to use that exhaustively testable pseudocode, um, and since, you know, they've been using this ever since, so <laughs> the accessibility is really important. Right, so I, I think actually that we are now within reach of a kind of vision where critical pieces of security systems, uh, uh, critical pieces of critical systems actually can be built out of verified software and that the composition of those to build a bigger system can be machine checked, verified to be correct, which would make buggy software no longer a security and easy attack vulnerability. And that means Black Hat is reduced to attacks that are less scalable. Right? If he has to go and physically put a rock in every car that he wants to hack, he can only carry so many rocks, right? So overall, we'll have much better security. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take questions. Yes? Uh, you said that if the, the system is uh, uh, separated on small components, it's easy to verify. Hmm. But, but isn't it uh, true that uh, verifying each component is not uh, the same as verifying the whole system as a whole? Right, so it, it, it doesn't verify everything. Absolutely. Right, so the, the, the quote or the, it came from the concert case where you could prove that each, um, each piece was doing, like was, was translating from this level IR to that level IR, this translation was okay. That particular proof, you can then take all of those things and if the assumptions line up, you can check that the assumptions all line up and you get the whole piece. You can prove certain kinds of properties that way, like functional correctness properties. But you couldn't prove memory usage. There are other properties that are global that require a different approach. And part of why the SEO4 example is so much higher is because like everything was this kind of global property that you had to prove, kind of taking the whole thing into consideration all the time. So yeah, yes to both, basically. Thank you. Yes? Uh, so what, what about the car in the beginning? What uh, about the is car? Is there any hope to verify the car? Because it's very different from a car that is running on a train or on a plane. Yeah. There's so many different uh, combinations in the codes. Is there any hope to verify that? Yeah, so let's see. So the car situation is in some sense the pessimal situation in that it's an industry that doesn't have a long tradition of super high quality software, under, <laughs> unlike the <laughs> aviation industry is much higher quality. It's also a place where um, the software development is very distributed. So the, the, co the car companies that we recognize as car companies are really buying components from a whole bunch of other companies and then putting them together. And the, the original, the OEM, the car company that we recognize as a car company, writes code to do all of that integration. But each of those parts itself comes with code, right? And so e even just calculating how many lines of code are running on a car, no one actually knows as far as I can tell because it's proprietary. So each vendor knows how much code they have, but nobody's in a position to be able to add up all those numbers and say. So estimates are 100 million lines of code on a car. Of course, most of that code has got to be dead, right? You don't need 100 million lines of code to do what cars are doing. Um, but it's probably like each vendor, instead of writing a, an operating system, goes and uses Linux or you know an RTOS or whatever. So there's lots of extra capabilities and extra functionality. And of course, that extraness is a huge bad thing from security perspective. Um, so it's and then the, the car they have super tight margins, so it's not a good situation. Um, I think one of the promising pieces is the. The, the idea that you don't have to verify everything. You could like really architect the car to figure out like what parts have to be secure and like addressing the network capabilities of the CAN bus, which has no authentic, like that's a place where more security would be a really good idea. I'm a little bit pessimistic about the, so when, when Charlie and when um, Stefan and Yoshi showed the original car was hackable, um, they notified the manufacturer. And the manufacturer stood up a relatively small group that was paid for out of their PR budget to be able to improve the security of the car. When, when Stefan and Yoshi, Stefan and, sorry, when Charlie and, and Chris attacked the Jeep on the road, with no more technical, like that wasn't technically any different, and they weren't showing any vulnerabilities that weren't shown before. So from a technical perspective, they didn't add any knowledge. Uh, Chrysler had to recall 1.4 million cars. It cost them a fortune. Um, they stood up a much more significant effort to improve the security. But I think it's still, I mean, I don't know for sure what's going on, but it doesn't seem like they're making as much progress as one would like. And I'm kind of worried that they might not actually do that unless there's a wide, like a, a real black hat attack on cars. And 
right now hackers seem to be focusing on ransomware and on cities, so um, maybe the car industry is, is safe for a while. And <laughs> I have a suggestion. I just bought a car after doing it for 20 years without. I went for a 1998 Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> I drive a Tesla, which is one of the cars that's known to be hackable, right? So. But my analog car burned down exactly the way she explained, with everything going electric, going on, and, and I still sat in it. So. Question? Uh, yeah, my question is about the hardened version of the quadcopter. Mm -hmm. Did it still use a standard Wi-Fi for the remote control? Uh, it did, but it, um, let's see, did it use standard Wi-Fi? Well, could you still de-authenticate the user who's fine? Uh, no, no. Really? Well. Yeah, so that's part of the, the code that they really did verify was the, um, they rewrote the authentication piece so that the, they knew who the ground, like they could verify that the ground station was authenticated ground station and that it was, they were only talking to the authenticated <coughs> user. That's part of what they proved about the whole system. Um, but so I don't... Well, I guess if you jam the signal in some way... So jamming the signal, that's an attack that still would work, right? They, don't, yeah. they can't do anything about guaranteeing that the, elect, that the messages get to the quadcopter, but they can prove that they only listen to the messages that came from right. a legitimate authenticated person and that have the right format. Yeah, right. Right, so they, yeah, they proved that if a message reached the quadcopter, then it was acted upon. They didn't prove that if a message was sent by the ground station, then it was acted upon, because they, didn't, they couldn't do anything about jamming. Yes? Is uh, yeah, anything of the robotic code for the quadcopter, for example, publicly available uh, to, to like, try to uh, yeah, reproduce proofs? Yeah, so all of the quadcopter proof is available open source. You can get it from Gawa, and the, the talk has a URL where you can download the quadcopter software. The Boeing code, no, but the quadcopter code. <laughs> <laughs> but that was in terms of like why we did it with these two. One was the open source, so like everybody could see it, and then one was a real system that people would be like, oh, okay, this isn't a toy. Yes. Yeah, one more. Yeah, okay. So a very hopeful talk you gave us. That's that's nice. <coughs> and I was thinking of this this Amazon. Yeah. Uh, TLS. Thing. You said, well, they made a proof, and then later on they changed the software, but only three times. The, the proof had to be redone. Right. So I was to think of the practical implications of that. I can imagine Amazon asking someone expert to do that proof, and then they go off and have the proof run, running, and then at once something pops up, and they have to adjust the proof. So they have to find someone knowledgeable enough to do this three times a year, and that, that <laughs> might be <laughs> kind of hard to. Of course, you have to have that team in house, but we are not that far. So there are some practical implications there. Did they tell some how, how that was solved or how they do that? Well, so Amazon Web, Amazon Web Services is a pretty serious commitment to formal verification. They have one of the, the best formal verification groups. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is what they're doing is they're providing uh, hosting cloud services for like the financial industry, who is super concerned that what goes on in their partition and what goes on in somebody else's partition do not interfere or affect each other. And so I think for Amazon Web Services, it's financially a good investment for them to have this capability. So I think that in their case, the formal methods engineers are working on other things that they care about and then periodically get poked to go fix this particular yeah. problem. I mean, Amazon is not typical of software development, but uh, I think what will happen with formal methods is that the sort of very high um, cost places, like the financial industry, the um, medical, you know, well, medical, uh, <coughs> aviation industry, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do the initial investment, the military, right? So basically the military and the finance are going to do the initial investments. And then we will develop the tools and techniques and know how to do this, and then it will gradually um, expand out to broader software. So like, that was the hope with hackums, right? The military cares because they know their adversaries that are trying to get in the way and, and stop the, their ability to accomplish their mission. Um, the hope is that we develop those tools and techniques and then the pen, the procurement officers in the Pentagon can write requests for systems that have requirements about you have to prove these properties in a machine checked way. The expectation is that the defense contractors would immediately respond by saying like that's impossible and then the procurement officer can say like well these grad students did it on Hackums, why can't you do it? So then they develop the capability and then they can bid and compete in that area. And then they have this capability that they could then start to use in other markets and medical devices are another like super um, relevant 
Like, my husband has a pacemaker. I would love to have his Wi-Fi. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> right? Like, they, they move this wand over his chest. Like, okay, we're now setting your heart rate to 80. You're like, uh, yeah, okay, verify this code, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much.